Good morning, everyone. I'm going to ask that all of our panelists turn their videos back on so that we can see them. And we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like we've still got people um, coming into the room, uh, but we are just so excited to have everyone here. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Okay. Sarah, can you go oh, ahead thank and, you. and stop sharing the screen? There we go. Great. Welcome everyone. So I'm so excited to have everyone here today. And since Zoom webinars can be a little bit unnerving, not knowing who is in the room with you, um, I just wanted to share that we are at about 40 participants plus our amazing panel. Um, and those participants are coming in from around the world and the number just keeps growing. I'm recognizing names from Malawi and Zambia, uh, the US, Ghana. Uh, so we've really got a global audience here for this event. Um, so with all of these people and all the experience and interest in this topic, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, if you could please feel free uh, to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions that come to your mind over the course of the event. Uh, we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the discussion. So this month, the UN Commission on Social Development is hosting its 59th session, and the priority theme of the proceedings is the socially just transition towards sustainable development and the role of digital technologies on social development and well-being of all. And as I was watching some of the events, there was one phrase that really stood out to me, and that is leaving no one behind means leaving no one offline. And you know, this has been a, a conversation in the development space for a long time. Uh, we've been talking about the digital divide and the concern of people being left behind. But in the last year, the response to COVID-19 has really pushed most of our lives online and in front of screens. And the true weight of that phrase has become more and more apparent. Um, and the real implications of the digital divide are continuing to grow. But what's great of, about what this moment brings is that there's more and more urgency as well to close the gap and to get more people online and connected to digital tools. Um, so today, I'm really excited to highlight one of the success stories that has been building for a long time, um, since way before the pandemic. And that's the increasing digitization of tools for smallholder farmers across Africa and really across the world. Um, this, digital, this digitization has been a critical link for farmers um, during the pandemic as they've navigated the ever-changing restrictions and public health requirements while maintaining their uh, livelihood through agriculture. And um, while this digitization is happening across Africa, we have decided to focus uh, this event specifically on Ghana. Um, and that's because the country has made huge strides in the last 10 years to connect this population to the internet. Um, when I first visited Ghana in 2011, um, I went as an exchange student and I remember how frustrating it was to try to send photos back home. My phone was so slow to upload and when it finally would, it would often time out and photos wouldn't make it or you know, part of the file would. And so when I went back in 2019, I was so pleasantly surprised that my phone immediately connected to the local network. I could browse the internet very quickly and the THP Ghana team and I were sending photos and videos back and forth over WhatsApp nearly instantaneously, even in the rural parts of the country where we work. Um, and this anecdote really highlights the progress that Ghana's made. In 2011, the country only had about 14% um, internet penetration. And today it's at about 38%. And that number is significantly higher when you look at mobile internet specifically. So the questions now remain, with this growth, which is still largely concentrated in the urban centers, how do we continue to connect rural communities? And once they are connected, how do we as development organizations and the private sector leverage the technology to support that community development? So to answer these questions, I have an amazing panel here with me today. 
Uh, Samuel Afrane is the country director for THB Ghana. He has over 17 years of experience in development planning, poverty reduction, and rural development. He and his team have been leading a lot of the Hunger Project's efforts to digitize our training programs and workshops, which I hope he's gonna share a little bit more about later in the program. Forrester Botang is the regional head for West Africa for AGRA. He joined AGRA in 2014 as a deputy country coordinator in Ghana, and then was appointed as the country manager for Ghana in 2017. He has 26 years of experience in program management and government engagement, and he is passionate about farm level transport technologies for smallholder farmers. Next, I have Lydia Karun, um, the business operations manager for the Microsoft Airband Initiative. And she is focused on international par partnerships and work to close the yeah, sorry, work to close the gender digital divide. Um, the Airband Initiative partners with equipment makers, internet and energy access providers, and local entrepreneurs to make affordable broadband a reality for communities around the world. Prior to joining Microsoft, Lydia worked on connectivity issues with Facebook. So next we have Warlali Senyo. He heads the corporate service at FarmerLine and has over 15 years experience blending agriculture and information and communications technology, working to create mobile and web technology that supports sustainable agriculture and rural development, with a particular focus on food security, agribusiness, and agricultural policy. Finally, we have Paul Saime. Paul is the director of the Agriculture Extension at the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Ghana. He's an experienced agriculturalist, extension, and rural development professional, and has been working hard to ensure that the government of Ghana is partnering with the private sector and NGOs to bring digital extension services to farmers across the country. So thank you all so much for joining me. Um, Lydia, I'm going to start with you, since the infrastructure needs to be in place before any community can leverage digital technology. Um, can you share a little bit about Microsoft's Airband Initiative and how it's helping create this connectivity in rural parts of Ghana? Yeah, of course. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so like you said, I work on the Microsoft Airband Initiative team focused specifically on our international partnerships. Um, and your intro really, really stuck with me because, um, you know, Microsoft's uh, mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Um, and obviously without connectivity, especially to un and underserved people, that mission is impossible. Um, so, you know, Airband was was founded on the idea that democratizing access to technology would enable more people to reach their full potential. Um, and our work obviously directly aligns with our mission, which is really a public private effort for attacking the digital divide. Um, so as I'm sure most people on this call know, nearly half of the world still does not have access to internet and over a billion people lack reliable access to energy. energy. Um, so Airband, you know, this isn't something that we do on our own and Microsoft is in itself directly a, a connectivity provider. So we actually partner in local markets. Um, in Ghana, our partner is a Danish-based company um, called Blue Town that specializes in rural access um, to connectivity. And, you know, so we have a, a variety of different models for partnering and, and bringing connectivity to areas. So we partner with internet service providers to help expand their networks into unserved areas. So Blue Town is an example of that. Um, we partner with hardware manufacturers to improve the quality and increase the volume of creative technologies. So an example of that would be TV white space, um, uh, which, the Ghanaian regulators have made it possible to use. Um, we partner with organizations like NGOs to ensure that when connectivity is available, people know how to use it and can get training, uh, get the training they need to participate in the digital economy. And then we partner with technology partners and communities to help them use the, the new connectivity to open educational, healthcare, agricultural, and economic opportunities. 
Um, so I think what's really key about that is we as Microsoft recognize that it's not enough to just bring connectivity to an area. We really have to work with our partners within the communities to make sure um, that the con there's actually value add from the connectivity. Um, so we focus on expanding broadband to bring digital transformation to four key areas, healthcare, agriculture, education, and then small business growth. Um, as, as folks know, you know, broadband can enable telehealth services, expand revenue, reduce costs in agriculture, facilitate virtual learning, and help small businesses reach more customers. Um, and sort of, we put it under this catch-all of digital transformation. Um, so for this specifically, you know, we do partner with um, agriculture uh, companies that are focusing on, on smallholder farmers. And we know that farmers with access to broadband can access precision agriculture to monitor and manage, or manage crops, increase efficiencies, and reduce costs. Um, and then our last focus area really is on access to financing. So again, we recognize that we can't do this alone and it really takes both public and private partnerships. Um, so we invest in projects, but we are not a bank. And so when our partners are really ready to scale and move from, you know, a few million in investment to tens of millions to hundreds of millions, how can we help set up a pipeline? So partnering with organizations like USAID, the Development Finance Corporation, what was previously DFID, um, helps us really grow and scale these projects in a very sustainable way, which ultimately is the focus. So when we think about Ghana specifically, um, we have our partner Blue Town, like I mentioned, an internet service provider. Our partnership with them will bring roughly 2 million people under coverage. Um, and right now, as they continue to deploy, um, we're really focused again on, okay, what are the educational offerings? What are the agriculture offerings? Um, and to be totally transparent, you know, this is a business proposition for us. Unlike companies like Facebook and Google, where when someone gets on, online, they start engaging with their services right away, we really have to make sure that the connectivity is meaningful and ultimately our goal is to have folks engaging with Microsoft Cloud services. Um, so that's sort of Airband in, in a brief nutshell, and I'm happy to share more in the, in the questions, but thank you again. Thanks so much, Lydia. I think one of the things that you touched on is this idea of scale and sustainability. And I think that is a really important part of this. And it brings in um, our partners over at Agra and Forrester. I, I would love to have you talk a little bit about this because Agra's uh, digital transformation efforts are working to improve the food security for 30 million farming households uh, across 11 countries by 2021, so this year. Um, and I know that you all do this through a network of village-based advisors. <clears throat> Can you share a little bit about the role that they're playing in this digital transformation and how they're supporting the sustainable scaling of these solutions? Thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you, my fellow panelists. Uh, for the sake of your audience, I'll just backtrack a little bit to give a little background about what AGRA is all about. Uh, AGRA in full is Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a farmer-centered and African-led and partnership-driven institution with a focus on helping smallholder farmers to transform agriculture for, from subsistence to making agriculture as a business, that's right. So for us, we feel that if you look at the agricultural system in, in Africa, it's in the hands of small landholders. And these small landholders are not very competitive. They are inefficient. They are inefficient in a sense that they produce little, and then also they are using antiquated method of technology that they are using to really uh, 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 expand the, the, their operations. So for us, as Agra, we feel that when we started our journey, the first thing we saw that, how do we improve production and the productivity of smallholder farmers? Then the next thing we need to look at is how do we really take technology from the labs and from the hands of scientists 
and put it at the disposal of smallholder farmers. In this case, I'm talking about access to improved seeds, fertilizer, and other technologies to enhance production or productivity of the smallholder farmer. We also realized that smallholder farmers need to assess this technology. So we talked about a last mile delivery. How do we really get to the smallholder farmer? If the smallholder farmer wants to use CCM fertilizer, does he need to travel 30 miles, 40 miles to assess them? It won't happen. So how do you really look at large smart delivery? And then the last one is for us, how do you really also improve labor productivity? Mechanization comes to play. Uh, I remember I live with a number of I-1 farmers. There's no way they can manage their farms without their four by four Ford pickups. So, so our farmers also, we need to make them more efficient. Making the plant efficient to yield more, you need the farmer to also be very efficient in his operations. So we, we think that digital technology plays a major role. Now our efforts in the digital tra tra transformation space involve working with service providers. We don't provide the service ourselves. We work with service providers. And I think we have worked in areas where we want to really improve and, and use digital applications to upgrade uh, uh, agro-food value chains in, in, in these countries. Now, if you look at the partners we work with, we, our focus has been in the area of supporting yield extension. How do you really get extension services to smallholder farmers? Because we all know that, and I think my fellow, my, my fellow panelist, uh, Paul, will tell you that even in Ghana, you have 5,500 farmers being serviced by one extension agent. But from the World Bank statistics, we need about 500 farmers to one extension officer. And so for you to improve some of these things, uh, you need to bring in other innovative ways of reaching out to smallholder farmers through extension. And that's where we've been using the village-based advisors. The idea of the village-based advisors were learned from uh, the health sector. The health sector, what we call the, the traditional birth attendants. It's not every village that you find uh, a midwife. So the Ministry of Health taught it twice to train women in villages who can provide that service. We thought that we can also build on the same model and use lead farmers, the youth, people in the community to be able to reach out to farmers. In extension, there's a popular saying that what you tell a farmer, he will doubt. What he sees, he may possibly doubt, but what he does himself, he will never doubt it. So when you are using another farmer to educate another farmer, it's very easy to really transmit your technology and information to the farmer. So that is why we came with this idea of village-based advisors and working with Hunger Project to expand to a number of villages. What we do, we work in connection with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture because Ghana have a pluralistic extension service where it allows both public and private extension. So we let them train these people to carry this information to the last mile. Now, the question is, how do you sustain that and, and, and pay them? We cannot pay them. Even government cannot pay the public extension. But there are systems we are putting in place. They are not just going as extension offices. They can also serve as input dealers. They can transmit input to these farmers and, and sell inputs to farmers and collect commissions for, from agro dealers who cannot reach that last mile. They can also aggregate produce from farmers and give it to aggregators and a commission on it, that's the way to sustain them. So for us, our extension, our digital platform, our digital technology goes beyond extension. We also look at the output market. We have also looked at how do you really get smallholder farmers involved in finance? So we have the digitization of payment systems. We also have what we call the use of agency banking. We have also promote mobile money uh, for loan disbursement, and then also Innovative new approach that came recently is how farmers can use mobile phones to really assess mechanization support, popularly known as structural tractor in Ghana. It's like an Uber. A farmer can go to with the app, can really source support from whoever is providing the mechanization service. As I said, we have worked with a number of partners. Farmerline is one of our partners that we have worked with. And uh, through the mobile payments, we've worked with Farmerline to reach about 27,000 farmers in Ghana, uh, working with a number of savings and loan companies who are supposed to also disburse loans to farmers. We've reached almost 11,000 with uh, advanced savings and loans. We have also worked with Pan-African savings and loans 
where we are reaching about 3,250,000 uh, farmers. For us, we are looking at using the digital system to look at from production to uh, market. How can we use this little device to make smallholder farmers more efficient and more productive? So, so thank you. I'll end here and maybe wait for a follow-up question that may come up. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's so important that you're looking at the full chain, right? The production yeah. to market piece is so important for these smallholder farmers who are involved in every single step of that. Um, and one of the things you alluded to was the partnership between the Hunger Project, Farmer Line, and um, the Direction of, of Extension Services, um, who are all working together right now to create a digital solution to help alleviate some of the strain on Ghana's agriculture services. Um, and part of that is through establishing this village-based advisor delivery model. Um, so Samuel, I want to turn to you and talk a little bit about um, how the Hunger Project's experience and expertise in community mobilization is supporting the effort with the village-based advisors. And um, what are the, some of the things that you're hoping to see in Hunger Project epicenters specifically as a result of this? Oh, you're muted. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, the Hunger Project has been implementing what we call the epicenter strategy for the past 24, 24 years in rural communities in Ghana. In fact, we cover about 450 rural communities covering about 350,000 people. And we employ what we call integrated approach of development, mobilizing the community, bringing them together identifying their potentials, and from there, working from their potential perspective, you know, to leap higher into modern means of development. And we work through what we call animators. These animators in this current, in, in what we are doing now, we call them village-based advisors. These animators we have for agriculture, agricultural animators, health animators, uh, water and sanitation animators, environmental, those who deal in environmental issues. And these animators serve as agents who study, you know, who are giving some of a you know, modern trends, modern educational knowledge to be able to lead their communities so that things that they are, they are used to doing, which are not working well for them, they can introduce modern technologies into it and then be able to leap higher in their development. And this is what the Hunger Project has been doing. Then coming to agriculture proper, as we are now talking about it, you know, we develop these animators or village-based extension agents so that they will be able to understand modern agricultural practices. And being people who are also into agriculture, living with the various farmers in the communities, obviously, if they are able to break the grounds and they are able to produce and increase their productivity, you know, compared to what they have been doing, all the farmers in their villages will see that one of their own has been able to adopt certain things and they are developing so speedily. And so they easily adopt the education that is given by these people who are, who become, who are part of the farmers themselves. So the Hunger Project, knowing very well that our smallholder farmers operate as individual farmers with their households, we we believe that these people need, need to be developed or brought together, you know, to constitute groups as we have been doing in the Hunger Project Epicenter Strategy that believes that communities, should, when they come together and they are able to look at their potentials together, they are a bigger force in the development arena. And for the 24 years that I talked about, 
This strategy has been adopted. And if you go to our epicenters, you see real rural communities that are up to the task of spearheading their own development efforts and bringing about wonderful development in their own uh, rural areas. And so we develop these groups in the agricultural sector so that they will come together and so that when they are together as a group, it becomes easier for them to adopt these modern technologies, especially with a digital uh, space that we now want to develop. So through the Greek extension agents that we are developing, when this digitization is introduced, the extension agent becomes the first person to understand how the system works. And then whatever technologies that are in there are transferred to the larger community groups, that is the farmers. And they readily believe in the very person because as Foster said, no, their seeing is believing. When they have seen one of their own practicing this and using it and achieving their objectives, they readily adopt it and they also use it and the transformation becomes so huge within a short space of time. So that is what we have been doing for the past three years. And in fact, with AGRA, we are training about, uh, we identified and are training about 2,240 rural agri extension agents to be able to work among uh, six, 672,000 small scale farmers in these rural communities. It's a huge number, but using this uh, uh, animator or village-based extension agent methodology, we are able to reach these big farmer groups. And when you see the transformation that is coming up, it is so wonderful because it is inclusive agricultural transformation. They see themselves as participating in whatever is happening. Digitization is very, very important in the first place because now our farmers are aging. In fact, we have an average age of about 50 years for farmers in Ghana. We are losing it out on the youth. They are not taking up agriculture. And we believe that the youth, you know, when digitization is introduced readily, it becomes attractive to the youth, the youth, especially in rural areas. So once they accept it, the youth will also stay in the rural communities and take farming as a business, instead of leaving it to our old aged parents to do farming as subsistence. Farming is a serious business. If we will be able to feed our multiplying populations. And so what the Hunger Project does is to mobilize these farmers into groups, identify the uh, village-based extension agent who becomes the uh, educator among the groups. And then the modern technology, in this case, the, the uh, digitization is introduced to the agent. And then the agent also carries out the introduction of all the good things within the digitization to the people on the ground. And it yields so much. They are also there with them. And so if there are any questions, any things that beats their minds, the, the agents are there for them to reach out to. So they easily get responses to their questions from these agents. And the agents could even visit their farms and share with them some of the things they can do. In times of emergency, like the army fall worm that Ghana experienced last year, this is one of the means because we have met technology can be transferred through this digitization and it gets to very large number of rural farmers and they can employ the methodologies to actually nip this in the bud. And so the, the severity of the army fall worm happen, uh, destroying their farms could be curtailed within a short time. So this is the very transformation that the Hunger Project through the epicenter methodology is transferring 
into the agricultural sector to make it work. It works very fast. I will end by saying that some of these extension agents or uh, animators that we trained are even utilized by the de government departments. The health sector, for instance, during the time of Ebola, our uh, health agents on the ground were used as educational agents for Ebola. So they had education, first-hand education on Ebola, how to create awareness and how to protect people's lives. And so they went around their communities to educate them with Ghana Health Service, providing them with motorbikes. So you see that even government institutions realize the potential in the use of these village-based agents because it is fast, it is efficient, it is also trustworthy because they are part of the farmers themselves. Thank you very much. I believe that with subsequent questions, we will throw more light on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Samuel. I think you said a couple of really big things there. Um, first is that we were able to you know, train 2, 000, a little more than 2,000 extension workers using these digital technologies. And in turn, they are reaching 672,000 smallholder farmers. That is a huge number. And it is so important to point out that that number exists, that they are able to expand their reach uh, through digital technologies. And they're, they're able to expand their impact and reach as many people as, as possible. Um, and to do that so quickly, in the cases of fall armyworm, where it really is a matter of time, and to get information out to that many farmers in order to protect their crops from a pest like the fall armyworm um, is just so important. And so Warlali, I'm gonna to turn to you because FarmerLine is uh, one of the digital tools that people are using to get this information out to these smallholder farmers. And uh, you all provide several levels of support from text messages uh, about weather forecasts and market prices. Um, to a more data-driven dashboards that farmers can access. Can you, um, how have farmers and other agriculture workers responded to these technologies and incorporated them into their farming practices? And what are some of the benefits that they're seeing on the, on the ground um, from these technologies? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity and um... At FarmerLine, our mission is to create lasting profit for farmers. And uh, the way we go about this is combining technology because we know there is power with, you know, the skill factor, economic skill that technology brings in leveraging resources, um, giving the challenges with, you know, uh, agents network to reach um, farmers that we serve who are really important in this case, important stakeholders feeding the world. Um, so what we do is we combine technology um, and, you know, a network of field agents to serve farmers and other agricultural stakeholders. Um, what we, we believe is that offering farmers, a farmer line, offering farmers a bundle of services, um, such as, you know, financing for input, um, you know, getting them, you know, access to information um, and educating them on best farm practices, which is what your question leads to, would increase productivity uh, because the literature supports that. There's a lot of evidence supporting how this, you know, can result in uh, increased productivity, reduce input harvest losses, and also connecting them to fair, um, you know, market. Um, where we sit, specifically around education, is that um, we need to, uh, what we're doing or what we are calling as our company, calling for the industry to do is uh, influencing farmers to change behavior in a way that um, will result in the positive outcome that we, we, we see. Because our theory of change is that um, if farmers change their behavior, the way they do things, not to say farmers do not understand, but if they get introduced to new ways of uh, doing things, reinforcing them with uh, leveraging digital technology, it would result in the impact that we, we want to see, i.e. Uh, increased yields, uh, farmers having good you know, profits, 
and the rest. And so we use our technology platform leveraging from basic voice, which um, by as you already might know, um, smallholder farmers in our part of the world are not literate in writing and reading English. So the most you know, preferred um, means of engaging is using voice, the local language. And so we have technologies that leverage this uh, too. And now with the you know, ubiquitous of uh, handsets and not to the extent of um, you know, connecting to the internet, uh, but then they can receive phone calls um, and these messages are tailored to reinforce trainings that they would have received that through, for example, the VBA uh, programs or um, the epicenter, you know, uh, workshops and whatnot that they will participate in. These serves as reminders to reinforce trainings that they, they have received, um, a call to take action, because that is what makes the difference in a farmer, you know, increasing the yield by uh, maybe 30% or as opposed to not, because by missing an opportunity of applying a required input, um, that can make the uh, you know the difference for a farmer increasing his, his yield or doubling his yield. So, um, we our technology offers sort of a plethora of you know mediums to support and improve um, the agricultural sector. We do not only help farmers, but we also work with other stakeholders. And as um, Foster mentioned. Partnership is key. And so uh, FarmerLine, we believe that working with stakeholders within the value chain, we can create greater opportunity for investment across the agricultural sector. Um, there are a lot of, you know, we've seen even in our own work evidence and also through the partnerships we have with um, Agra, uh, the Hunger Project and other key players, even within the global traders and manufacturing space. Uh, we're seeing quite, you know, exciting evidence of work that digital technologies are bringing, uh, you know, to bear. Um, so first of all, let me sort of talk about in our own work, um, our direct, you know, support to smallholder farmers. Um, so for example, last year, uh, with our own, you know, um, agent force, we served over 30, 4,000 farmers with high quality input through our input program. And uh, research from our previous years suggests that at least some of these farmers, about 65% of these farmers um, are receiving input, you know, through this program, um, you know, our credit program for the first time. Um, and um, the challenges that smallholder farmers face in growing, you know, uh, producing high quality and also meeting the recommended standard are based on some of these challenges that they face, access to you know, credit, uh, their training and all that. So we providing these to help them to sort of, um, you know, produce well to, to, to feed and also to get a, a better living and income for themselves. And most of these farmers, uh, about 89%, uh, you know, indicating interest in returning because the the, the service that they receive uh, with their basic you know uh, tools, sort of the phone, they are getting reliable weather forecast um, when they should take specific activities on the farm. Even using it for other social you know uh, planning and activity you know activities as well. For example, whether they should go out for a particular social event. And um, recently with the COVID, as we have this COVID pandemic, we're also using that as a medium to, you know, educate farmers, to educate, you know, to sensitize them about the dangers of COVID and how they can, you know, protect themselves. And quite interesting, you know, uh, revelations from some of our, um, you know, um, feedback sessions we've had as to, you know, what farmers think about the COVID and all that. And this is what technology is offering. Uh, to support um, smallholder farmers in general. Um, last but not least on the farmer side or farmer group side is, um, you know, using technology, I think Foster alluded to that, farmers getting access to fair market. So being paid right then and, and leveraging the power of mobile uh, money, uh, farmers now can receive payment right on their mobile phone. They can know that indeed for the bag of grain or you know soya or you know that they've supplied this is the money you know they've been paid for and this is a way to help 
bring this, you know, uh, especially being an informal sector and not having much visibility and hence um, they not being attractive to the, you know, traditional financial, you know, sector, having these transactions digitized opens a lot of opportunities for smallholder farmers, you know, attracting the needed capital to finance their operations. Um, the other side we see in terms of benefits um, is to partners that we work with as well. So we look at agribusinesses um, from global traders, manufacturers, and local SMEs, which for us is really critical because um, a lot of the activities they do are in the, you know, I think formal, and they really, you know, I'm, I'm sure we are familiar with their hidden middle term. They move a lot of, you know, uh, resources and there isn't much visibility in what is happening, which enhance inform how policies can be designed to support, uh, how programs can be designed to uh, you know, enhance their activities. And so what we are seeing is really increasing transparency with you know, leveraging digital tools um, that we offer to partners that we work with uh, across several value chains um, uh, from you know, the cash crops to the staples. Um, we also seen uh, that businesses are having more, you know, customer loyalty in terms of, you know, uh, their farmers and stakeholders they're working with um, now express more interest because uh, you're getting better insights into what challenges there are, and so you are addressing your interventions or programs to make sure you are you are, you know, resolving that in a more, you know, near real time, and that's the power of you know, uh, what technologies offer to uh, partners in, in the agribusiness space. Um, the, there's also a bit on, I mean, we all are aware that um, our world is facing you know, climate change issues and we cannot you know, um, deal with it effectively if we don't have enough data and insight into what our activities are contributing or how we should mitigate um, certain activities that we're undertaking. And technology uh, leveraging satellite imagery, um, AI is making this even more uh, near to a lot of uh, partners that we work with, uh, helping them to plan interventions more you know, tailored uh, in their training programs to farmers that, for example, are working in encroach or in uh, forest reserves, um, activities they can do, finding other alternative income, you know, um, programs in their farming communities that could help, you know, save the environment. And these are being made possible because of the use of technology, um, as opposed to relying on, you know, traditional approaches, which may take quite a long time for these to come to bear. Um, the other part of our partnership is current work we're doing with Agra, uh, Hunger Project, and other, you know, uh, government as well, the, uh, through the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and especially through the Gessip Project, which is leveraging, you know, uh, the use of extension platform, you know, e-extension to deliver information to, um, to smallholders and complementing the work of field agents. And for us, we believe that uh, technology is yet to complement. It's not necessarily replacing as of this now, will not necessarily replace, but it is to complement and further and enhance the work of our extension officers. Uh, we're seeing for, for some works we did with uh, the SRID, uh, which is a statistics and research directorate of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Uh, we implemented a copy system, which sort of saw quite drastic reduction in the time it takes for data to be you know uh, collected typically they undertake this agricultural census and it reduced from uh, almost a year to about a month just because of implemented digital solution and that is a part of what technology brings to 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 the bay and this in 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 in, in, re, in respect helps to inform policy programs that can be more you know proactive than being you know sort of an after you know effect um, we also seen work uh, being done around monitoring and surveillance. For example, the fall army worm issue that was mentioned, um, using you know technology, farmers with their basic phone can actually call into our IVR system to report you know challenges or you know ob observations they've seen on their farm, and this in a way helps improve how we are more responsive and you know 
uh, supporting uh, farmers and also the world in general in, in combating or in addressing our food security issues. Um, I'll pause here and I, I think if uh, some follow-up questions come through, we'll be happy to um, expand on some of the points I've mentioned. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm really interested in what you were talking about with the climate change work because it's, it's really apparent that um, through the technologies, it's helping build resilient communities and resilient smallholder farm tracks um, of people who are able to respond to the challenges uh, that climate change is throwing at them as, as farmers and as business people. So I'm hoping we get back to that during the Q&A the Q&A portion. Um, finally, Paul, I'd like to turn to you and just hear a little bit about how governments uh, can mainstream and sustain the digital solutions uh, that are helping improve extension delivery to the smallholder farmers uh, across Ghana. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my earlier colleagues, Foster and the uh, other two, uh, Walali and Samuel, uh, virtually knows the situation in the agriculture extension space in Ghana. In fact, the, the uh, presentation virtually took away some of the statements I would have made. Now, uh, the challenge facing agri extension delivery in Ghana had been problem of outreach, reaching out to especially our large number of smallholder farmers. And the situation, like uh, Foster mentioned, he even was very economical with the extension agent farmer ratio. You know, he made mention of 1,500 farmers to one uh, uh, extension agent. But it was actually close, uh, almost one extension agent to 1,908. That is virtually one extension agent was attending to 2,000, nearly 2,000 farmers. So the government, or for that, the Minister of Food and Agriculture in 2017, realized that there was the need to change the situation. And then the ministry, our minister sought permission from the Minister of Finance or the government, and approval was given for the recruitment of uh, 2,700 extension officers to add to the existing mega 1,586. So we're hoping, in fact, that our minister was still bent on getting additional numbers only for COVID to come in and we realize that we cannot depend on just the extension agents to reach out to our family because there were containment measures, where restrictions, we couldn't assemble farmers and therefore we had to explore other alternatives. Luckily for us, we had thought about it that we need to have complementary extension uh, approaches like that is ICT focused uh, uh, interventions to complement whatever numbers we had before the monumental 2,700 engagement of extension agents by government. So we were working together with uh, uh, Agra, with support from Agra, we had to partner our private sector like uh, Foster said, we are in Ghana, we are practicing the pluralistic extension services delivery. We want not only public service extension, but the private sector. We want to empower or create the environment for private sector to also uh, participate in the uh, extension services delivery. So we did, uh, we had a number of partnership with our private sector. We also believe in an African saying that it takes more than one to contain or arrest a uh, a marauding, mentally deranged uh, person when he's on rampage. And therefore we believe in partnership. And that encourages us to enter into a number of arrangements so that we, we leverage on the capacity, the human resource capacity of some of our partners, not, notably the Hunger Project, uh, CRS, Cattle Relief Services, and then the Farmer Line, as well as other partners who may be who are smaller than the, this institution, but we still think that we need their human resource, their expertise, and others to reach out. So we were fully for digitalization of agricultural technical knowledge dissemination, and and therefore we partnered with uh, 
all these uh, institutions. Uh, currently, why we have to depend on partnerships or ensure that we use other forms is that when we government gave, when we recruited the 2,700, it brought our number of uh, extension agent to farmer to one, one extension agent to 709. This still falls short as uh, in nine farmers. This still falls short of the recommended or the, the standard number of one agent to 500. But because of the topography, the terrain even in Ghana, some of us think that one extension agent to 500 farmers is still living on the high side when you get to some of our remote areas. So we see use of ICT enabled uh, infrastructure as a means to reach our farmers, as a major one that has come to stay and the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and for that matter, the government of Ghana is ready and is supporting all interventions that will make sure that we have a, a good uh, environment that will encourage other actors. Like we have our partner, Hangar Project, the rest who have certain resources or who can leverage on, we can take advantage of their numbers to support whatever interventions uh, we want to do. Uh, like I indicated, maybe uh, Foster and Wolali, as well as Samuel virtually mentioned the situation in Ghana, but the Ministry of Food and Agriculture is ready to partner and work with, because our objective is to improve and increase farmer outreach. That's farmer extension farmer outreach. And we think one of the huge ways we can help improve is the use of digital platform. I mean, we are putting a lot of uh, uh, interventions in place for partnerships and to lead the process for improving extension outreach. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's such an important point about using partnerships to expand your reach and really improve the outreach part of, of your work. Um, so what I wanna do next is a kind of rapid fire question and have each of you answer in uh, about a minute. Um, given how much has changed in the last 10 years when it comes to digital solutions and agriculture, what do you think is most needed in the next 10 to help us reach a zero hunger world by 2030? And I'm gonna start with uh, Forster. Yeah, th th thank you, uh, Anna. But quickly, I must say that uh, we also have international partners like Microsoft. Uh, we have a partnership with you in Tanzania on the Kuza boat, where we are reaching more farmers with uh, extension uh, information through WhatsApps and SMS. Quickly, let me come back to your question, uh, Anna. For me, I, I think uh, by and large, African, for African governments are, become, uh, are beginning to look at agriculture uh, through a, a transformative lens. And for me, uh, there's a need to prioritize the sector. And, and, but there's still, we still have some barriers in the sector, dysfunctional input and output market, dysfunctional extension. Uh, we, we, we also look at where access to finance and all those things. For me, I think uh, these are areas where technology can help us using digital technology and, and also partnering with government to take it to scale. Uh, you can see that most countries are, are really running subsidy programs for input uh, under the pretext that the market has failed in reaching the last mile uh, uh, farmer. But I believe that if government create an enabling environment to attract private sector, as my friend uh, Paul has said, to work with the private sector, we can go a long way. We also have to look at technologies that really also address resilience. None of us thought that COVID was going to come. So in, in person extension, I wouldn't want to say it's obsolete. Otherwise, Paul would not have a job. But <laughs> <laughs> let me say that it's becoming yeah. imperative that we, we start using technologies that we reduce in person contact because COVID has yeah. come to live with us and we don't know what will come next. So for me, we need to build resilient systems that will let farmers uh, be able to withstand stresses and shocks. So Great. that's what I'll say for now. Yeah. Okay. Paul, how about you? What's, what is most needed in the next 10 years? Yeah, 
uh, you know, as mobile phones and uh, other ICTs continue to gain popularity and offer unique opportunity to share information among large numbers of persons, farmers inclusive, uh, there's little doubt that uh, ICT has a key role to play in agricultural extension systems towards working to zero hunger. Even though it may not be the all in all solution for that is facing extension, we think that integrating ICT as a communication channel, potentially reaching millions of farmers, is an enabler and it could play a critical role in uh, bringing reforms and improvement towards attainment of uh, this. The only challenge we, we, I see or we see or we need to look at is the diversity of African farmers, particularly Ghanaian farmers, where you may have a package of agricultural technical knowledge, but you have to work on it to tailor it to meet the unique and personalized needs of the farmers so that we don't pick a message, derive and send it by through telephony, you know, the various ICT channels without considering the target audience. So we just, we just, we have to do a lot of work on targeting and providing this ICT info, information through these channels to meet the unique needs of our varied farmers, because you don't go to a place and have only if you get to a community, you don't have only maize farmers, you can get to a community where there's varied, even where we have even maize farmers, sometimes their interests or their challenges vary. Somebody will be will having more issues to do with uh, marketing, while some others will be looking at improve or enhance access to inputs. So Thank I think you. that's what we need to look at, uh, personalizing or targeting the audience with the ICT enabled agricultural technical knowledge. Great. Lydia, how about you? What do you see as must, must, the most needed thing? Um, I think as is exemplified by this conversation, um, you know, thinking about ending hunger holistically um, and, and recognizing that it's not just a problem of growing more crops or creating a digital solution that works for smallholder farmers, but really compounded by, you know, a lack of access to connectivity, a lack of access to energy, education, training. Um, and so, I, again, as I think almost everyone in this conversation touched on, what's really essential is partnership. So whether that be private public sector partnership or partnering within the private sector to recognize that this is a larger problem and using technologies from, from multiple different sources, you know, how do we tackle this in a really holistic way to create solutions that are targeted towards smallholder farmers and not just modified for them um, and that really makes sense for rural and unserved communities. Thanks. Warlali, how about you? Uh, thank you. I think the, my colleagues have already said um, most of the, the points. Just to add on to what they've said, um, for me, farmers are still critical. And so the way we influence their behavior towards being autonomous, more autonomous and responsible entrepreneurs will be very critical in how you know we end hunger in the next 10 years. They have to see their work as a business and we need to equip them with the necessary tools and resources to make them you know, succeed as entrepreneurs. Um, the second point I would say is um, having you know, very, you know, innovative models around taking how we can take services, um, resources to farmers. Um, one of the biggest challenges is the cost of delivery of services to a lot of uh, farmers in remote areas. And it makes a lot oftentimes the, um, the interventions not, you know, successful, but finding very innovative ways of delivering that and harnessing and scaling them through partnerships is, is the ultimate way that I believe we can, um, you know, end hunger in the next 10 years. Thank you. And Samuel, how about you? What, what is most needed in the next 10 years? Uh, thank you. What I will also say is that we need to 
mobilize all our farmers, mobilize them because there are a whole lot of them that are still individualistic. And so they need to be mobilized so that consciously they can all come together to become more self-supportive. Because when they are mobilized and they come together, they support themselves. They look at themselves, their group, as the ultimate you know, responsible institution to bring about development onto themselves. And then I will also quickly mention that we need to quickly expand the digital infrastructure so that by that time it reach in Ghana, it should reach everywhere because it's really pathetic. You go to the rural areas and you see that they hang their mobile phones at a particular spot. And then somebody is sitting by it because it is only at that point that you can receive messages and that message is then relayed to the others. So if we can expand the digital infrastructure such that these farmers can easily access it in wherever they find themselves. And then they are mobilized to be able to see whatever they do as they themselves developing themselves more than depending on others. I believe that if we have that, then we would go a long way to bring real development to the agricultural sector. Thank you. So we're going to move into Q&A from the audience. Um, and one of the things that's come up in several questions is the engagement of women. And as I was doing some research to prepare for this panel, uh, one of the things that I found out is that uh, the digital technologies are allowing the extension workers to reach more smallholder farmers who are women. Um, in the past, those who are overstretched tend to focus on the larger farms which are often held by men um, and therefore women would often be overlooked. Um, so when the extension workers have more time and are able to reach more people, they are able to focus more specifically on women. And so I'd love to hear from a few of you. I don't know who is the best position to speak to the engagement of women through this. Um, perhaps Paul and Warlali, I would love to hear from the two of you um, a little bit more about the, the way that you both are working with women and mobilizing small uh, smallholder farmers who are women. Thanks. Um, I don't know, Paul. Do you want me to? Oh no, you start. <laughs> you start. I'm for. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I think the issue of um, you know uh, gender is really critical, especially women farmers. Um, I think the statistics show that we have more women farmers. Um, of course, in some specific value chains, uh, but it is important that um, there are, you know, cultural and, you know, systemic issues that oftentimes put women at a disadvantage. So for us as a company, our program are being very um, intentional, even within the organization, is being very conscious of engaging and providing, you know, uh, sort of an equity, equi equitable, it's not an equal, more equity in how women can be able to access uh, resources and also, you know, be supported. And so, for example, last year, our, our program intervention, um, our database is showing that we have more women engagement just because of the decision to, you know, focus on specific value chains that have more women, you know, involved in. I think those are things that uh, doing would uh, further, you know, balance the or help create equity in um, in this discussion. Uh, secondly, I, I mean, it, it's going to, it, it's more, you know, um, probably looking at, at a more policy level in terms of creating um, incentives that could encourage more women groups, especially um, because that's where you have a lot of, you know, uh, participation and, you know, um, engagement uh, to drive this. And uh, interesting fact from our data shows that women are more engaged with information that is received using, uh, you know, um, e extent through the e extent. Women are more engaged in that as opposed to the male counterpart. So there are certain, you know, programs and, you know, approaches that we can adopt 
to harness, you know, um, um, way we engage with women and also encourage them to be, you know, at the forefront of, um, you know, benefiting from support services, not treating them as, you know, second class or uh, as an afterthought, um, if I should put it that way. Paul, anything to add to that? Yes. Uh... Yes, uh, the ministry, or uh, for that matter, the, my directorate, uh, we work to ensure uh, the active engagement of women in many of the ministry's uh, interventions. So what we do is, for example, to give a typical case is where you want to reach out or you want to eliminate the advantage group like men in certain society, you go in for a commodity where the women have the competitive advantage in. For example, the experience we have in the North is that when you introduce cowpea and the granite as a commodity, you initially will get more women getting into it. Then you follow it up with rice and other uh, commodities in subsequent years, as well as other interventions. Because the men already have a, a, some a mass, uh, some coverage above the women when it comes to uh, some other commodities, but gradually, we give and we encourage and also try to, like I said, some affirmative action. In. When you go in for cowpea, you go in for maize, uh, you go in for granules, you automatically get the men out. And that is where we can then reach the women that form group around these commodities to also participate in the male dominated uh, agricultural commodities. So this has been one. Then also we make conscious effort to report uh, on gender disaggregated data for reporting purposes, so that no Minister of Food and Agriculture official in the region or in the district will report on program and uh, projects or interventions without reporting on uh, providing gender disaggregated uh, data on participants. Thank uh, you. Thanks so much. Uh, so yeah, sure, uh, let, can go I, ahead. I make it. Yeah, I, I, just, I just want to add that this digital extension has also helped us to improve exclusion because unlike the in-person extension, uh, when you go to some parts of Ghana, I don't think I want a handsome male like Paul to talk to my wife, who is an agriculture, who is a farmer. But with, with, with digital extension, uh, it doesn't have a face. It doesn't have to see Paul. It can send information to women. So for me, it's also another way of bridging the gap in terms of exclu ex exclusion and, and also dealing with the vulnerable uh, 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 segment of society who are, we find themselves in agriculture. Second, I think it's not only about the value chain, but if you look, it's not only about the crop that women are engaged in. If you come to Ghana and look at the value chain, especially in Ghana, the women fall between the, the post-harvest component in, in terms of marketing. So what kind of technology we can give to them to assess market information, how they can also improve their access to payment. So we need to look at the segment within the, 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 the value chain and see where women are, are really, really, really involved and see how we can improve uh, the technology that we provide to them. Yeah. But finally, I also like uh, when you come to Ghana, apart from the extension, the Ghana government have set up what we call women in agricultural development. So they are very sensitive to issues pertaining to women and how women are also serviced when it comes to agricultural so, uh, support. Yeah. So. Great. Lydia or Samuel, do either of you have anything to add to this? Yes, I want to quickly add a little to what uh, Foster just said. You know, one key thing that we need to push forward is women's leadership in mostly some of these institutions that are set up, the village-based extension agents. You know, when we look at the exercise that we carried out, in fact, getting even 20% of all the agents to be women becomes a very difficult, you know, exercise because this, the, we, mostly the women in the rural areas have been assigned with traditional responsibilities. So they don't, in quote, not, they don't have much time, you know, to do these things. So we should consciously encourage them and discuss with them how they can free some of their times 
not overlooking their, their, what they have been doing in their households, but doing it in a different way and still getting some time to take up some of these leadership roles in what we, 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 we are encouraging in the agricultural sector. Because it is only when they take up these responsibilities that this becomes appealing to the young girls and women who are now coming up. So they look on them as role models and would also want to do that. So in all leadership positions, especially the women in agriculture is advancing. Whatever we do in the agricultural sector, when it comes to building leadership, we must consciously rope in the women, encourage them because they would want to sit back initially. But when we encourage them and they come in, they perform very wonderfully. So I'm highlighting on giving encouragement to our women because they have wonderful potentials to exhibit. Thank you. Thanks, Samuel. Lydia, how are women being incorporated into the Air Band Initiative? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. We have been doing a lot of work um, to address the gender digital divide specifically um, and help encourage and support our partners both financially and with expertise uh, to target and create connectivity solutions targeted towards women and girls. Um, I think as Samuel just said, you know, the opportunity cost, as we all know, is higher for women to begin engaging with connectivity. And so there really needs to be a strong value proposition to bring women and girls online, whether that's through training, targeted solutions, whatever that looks like. So we have been partnering um, through the Women's Global Development Fund and USAID um, to create grant funding that is targeted towards connectivity solutions for women and girls. Um, and then actually that's part of our partnership with the Hunger Project who is working on that project with Blue Town in Ghana um, to help support that work as well. So, you know, I think again, it goes back to this holistic approach of it's not just connectivity, it's not just agriculture solutions, there really needs to be a targeted and holistic lens um, to bring women and girls online and get them engaging with solutions. Great, thank you so much. Um, we had a number of other questions as well, a lot of them ranging from the, the details to the business models that y'all are employing uh, to the sustainability of of all these initiatives. And I think uh, one of the things that's been very evident throughout this conversation is that by using village-based advisors and digital technology, um, it really is creating a sustainable way for people to engage with smallholder farming and to create agribusinesses um, out of those farms. So um, unfortunately, I don't think we have enough time to take any more of those questions that are coming in. Uh, but I would just really like to thank all of you for your time today and for your insight into this issue. Um, this was a really wonderful conversation and I'm really hoping that you all got something out of it. Um, I hope our participants did and um, just thank you once again for participating and, and joining us today. Okay. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank all right. you all so Thank much. You, uh, okay.